Welcome to Make Art with Biology and Robots, a workshop designed to help you make art with biology and robots. So, uh, my name is Tim Dobbs, and I'm the creator of BioArtBot, and this is a project to help you make art using biology and robots. All right, I'm seeing in the chat, I'm seeing in the chat that uh, they can hear me, everything sounds good, um, and uh, I love it, great, cool. Um, yeah, a little bit about me before we jump into it, um, just so you know kind of who you're talking to. Uh, like I said, I made BioArtBot. Um, it's, it's this great tool, I think, to help you, you know, make cool art, basically. Um, I'm a biotech engineer. I've worked in biofuels, pharmaceuticals, even like low calorie sweeteners, just like making stuff. But ultimately, uh, I just like learning by doing. I like tinkering with stuff. I like playing around. And really, that's kind of why I made BioArtBot, which this is a robot, and we're going to get more into that in a second. Um, but I made it just uh, because it's a fun way to learn by doing, and I'm hoping to kind of share that with you so you can kind of learn by doing as well. And that's going to be a lot of this classes. By the way, thank you, Callie, in the chat. I do love my mask, right? Um, and uh, great. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Now let's talk about where I am, like this whole um, warehouse I'm in, right? Uh, this is actually Counterculture Labs, who is graciously hosting this workshop. This is our very first live streamed workshop. Um, we were kind of thrown off during the pandemic, uh, and now we're kind of like talking about more ways to get it going. Um, so I'm going to move to a new view. Beautiful, seems to be working. Uh, and uh, tell you just a little bit about it, give you some kind of visual aids in addition to kind of everything behind me on Counterculture Labs. It's Oakland's Community Science Lab. It uh, has lots and lots of different projects and is a place to sort of come, anyone can come learn and, um, you know, play around, have some fun and do meaningful science. Uh, Counterculture Labs' projects include things like real vegan cheese. So that's a way to make cheese without using animals at all. Open insulin, a way to make open source, low cost insulin available to anybody. That's pretty exciting. Uh, kombucha genomics, art and science, applied mycology, if you like mushrooms, all kinds of great stuff. So I encourage you to check out uh, Counterculture Labs if you're interested in this kind of stuff, especially if you're in Oakland, California. Um, and uh, there's information about that. Uh, should be kind of down in the, the live stream below us. And uh, you know, if not, it's, it's elsewhere. We'll see more about that later. So what else? Ugh, working on my presentation skills, huh? Let's talk about BioArtBot now. Um, what the heck is this? Well, basically, it's a tool to learn three things, biology, robotics, and software engineering. And kind of if you put all this together, that uh, they come together to make this thing that we often call synthetic biology. In the past 10 years or so, we've kind of come up with this new term, call it synthetic biology. But it's, it's kind of these three things, um, or these are kind of three of the core components of it. And so BioArtBot does all those things, so it's a great way to learn. In addition, it's a cool way to make art. And so uh, you can see kind of down here in the lower part, let's see, I'm kind of working on my live stream technique. Can I point to it? Ooh, it's kind of over there, I think. <laughs> uh, so you can make a drawing. You go to bioartbot.org. You make a drawing here, like uh, this absolute hero did who made this Pikachu. And then it grows with living ink. So each of those little dots is a colony of E. coli that grows and makes bright colors. Um, and the idea with BioArtBot is uh, anybody can do it. It's supposed to be easy and learnable. So at the very beginning, you can, you can just go to this website and make a drawing. And I, a lot of you did, which is really exciting for me. And we're going to print those today. Uh, but also, anybody with a robot can make one of these, or can do the printing part. Um, I may or may not have included a slide on that. Oh, I did. Good for me. <laughs> So the easiest thing to do, everybody's got you know, a smartphone, a computer, or something. They can go make one of these drawings. Uh, if you have a robot, and these guys are the sort of thing that maybe a, a community science lab, a library, um, a university can, can buy, um, you can actually print the bioart. So another component of bioart is that anybody can do it uh, at any level, so, or at, at a level. So you can maybe draw it. But if you want to be a printer, and you have a robot, 
you know, contact me. It's tim at bioartbot.org, and we can get you set up to be someone else who can help do this printing. So either you can print for yourself, or you can work in our network of people who, you know, trade art around. Um, that's what I like about it. It was so exciting to see all of your cool art that we're going to print today, and I'm really jazzed to, like, help bring uh, what you've got to light. Okay. Let's talk about today, and then I swear, then we'll be done with all the intro stuff. Um, so I'm loving the chat. Keep it up. Uh, this will be about two hours. It might run a little less. Uh, we'll just kind of see. It'll, you know, it'll be a lot of back and forth. I'm going to read the chat the whole time, and uh, we'll just kind of see uh, how long we want to talk for. Um, but the goal is basically we're going to print your bio art. A lot of you went and made um, drawings, and I got all of them. And I love them. And what we're going to do is print them with biology today. And then we'll stick them in an incubator. And in about 48 hours, they'll be done. And you'll get your pictures later this week to see how your cool art grew. I really wish I could um, you know, physically give you the, the, the growing art. Uh, but I haven't figured out a way to mail it yet. So if anyone's got ideas on that, hit me up. How are we going to talk about this? Part one, talk about the biology. So how do you grow and make the colors, your sort of paint set? Secondly, we're going to talk about the robots. They actually do the drawing for us because my hands are here, but none of your hands are here, and you guys are the guys with the ideas. Then we'll talk about the software that kind of lets these two things work together. And then finally, we'll do the printing. And finally, and then we're ready to go, I just want to talk about like streaming and stuff. Uh, like I said, this is one of my first times doing a stream like this. It's one of Counterculture Labs' first time doing a stream like this. And uh, it's just me here. Where for pandemic reasons, we've kind of kept the space very empty, very minimal. And um, so it's just me. I'm doing all the stream tech, all the production. I'm clicking all the buttons. I'm in here. I'm over there. Um, <laughs> so if something goes wrong, if the audio cuts out, if, if the video looks weird, if something's kind of jumping around or whatever, uh, let me know. Shout it out in chat. I'm, uh, I'm looking at the chat as much as I can, and additionally, I've kind of devised a little thing where I've got a little Bluetooth headphone in my ear here, and um, my very gracious uh, producer is, is sitting at home just kind of watching the stream, making sure it works, and if something goes really quite wrong, she'll just kind of shout in my ear and be like, hey, fix it. And so, uh, so do that as well. <laughs> um, hopefully nothing goes wrong with the stream, uh, but also, hopefully, nothing goes wrong with the science, but it might. And so I just want to warn, with, warn you about that right now. This is all live. We're doing real science. And it could break. Maybe something goes wrong. Who knows? Um, and uh, that's part of the fun. And even if something goes wrong, we're going to learn something. And we're going to, um, I don't know. I think we're just going to have a lot of fun today. And yeah, and thank you. Thank you to the chat. I'm seeing. Uh, the stream's looking good. I'm really glad I, uh, I spent some time getting it together. So uh, thank you for that feedback. Finally, the material. Uh, if you've got questions, I want you to shout them out. Like I said, I'm going to keep looking at the chat, keep talking. Oh, got my six. Perfect. Um, and uh, yeah, like just, just put them in there. I might not get to them right away, but I'm going to try to look at them all. There may be some things, because we are actually talking about kind of a lot of stuff. There's biology, there's robots, there's software, there's you know, the actual printing. Um, just shout out, like, oh man, I want to learn more about this. And that's totally cool. And what we'll do after the stream is I'll go look at them, and maybe we can do a follow-up stream to dig into one specific part earlier. Um, yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine and Chet. Uh, it's not real science unless something goes wrong. That's how you learn. OK, I think we're ready. I think we, uh, this is the entire, that was my whole spiel, I'm pretty sure. All right, so we're going to move to, ah, it's me. I'm big. Um, and talk about, oh, no, wait, hang on. I want to show you this. Biology. I just love this guy. Um, OK, so let's talk about the biology. I'm going to get some gloves on here. This is one of the tricks about running your own stream, is that you probably shouldn't use your gloves to touch your computer, because you're getting like lab stuff all over it. But you should use gloves to pick up genetically engineered organisms, both for your safety and to not track these organisms anywhere. So I got my gloves on. Um, 
just to be extra safe, I'm going to spray them. This is 70% isopropyl alcohol. Maybe this is something you've heard of before. Maybe it's something you got familiar with during the pandemic, but it should sanitize my hands just in case so I don't really mess up anything I'm about to touch. I'm going to open up my guy here and show you this. So I'm going to take off the lid here. There you go. So as you can see, this is cool art. So yeah, oh yeah, there we go. That looks that looks pretty good. So this is some cool art, and every one of these dots here is millions, if not billions, of bacteria, uh, and they they form a colony. So this bacteria is called E. coli. If you haven't heard of it, um, maybe uh, well maybe you have heard of it. Um, a lot of times when we hear about E. coli. We think of food poisoning. Um, let me pull that. Actually, you can keep looking at it. So we think of food poisoning, and that's because there is a version of E. coli that can get into our food and make our stomachs upset. This is not that E. coli. There's actually lots of kinds. So um, this one is actually pretty harmless. And in fact, lots of E. coli are already in us all the time. If you look down at your own, at your own belly, you're looking at a lot of E. coli, I got to tell you. <laughs> so this stuff is totally safe. The reason that we are extra careful with it, though, is you'll notice it is brightly colored. So what's the difference between all these different E. coli? These are genetically engineered. This one, all of these dots are genetically engineered to make kind of blue. This one is pink. This one is supposed to be teal, and it is not, because I really hate our teal strain. More on that later. Um, so uh, yeah. So that's what's going on here. This is, this is, this is what our art was going to look like. I made this uh, a couple of days ago, and I think it came out pretty good, except for teal. So what's going on that makes these colorful? You know, when you hear like, let's just say mold is growing on your bread, you're not like, ooh, the bright colors on the mold. Or maybe you are, and in which case, you're pretty cool. Uh, so I'll show you another plate here. And this is just me. I use my hands to kind of, uh, they call it streaking. So what this is, so you kind of get this against my blue jacket, you can kind of tell. Um, this is each of our five colors that we have available. And basically, I just took, uh, took a little stick. I stuck it into a, some uh, little bottle. Then we're going to see these later. Um, yeah, I know, I see it. The, the teal would be so cool, and sometimes it grows and it looks really cool, but it's so finicky. Um, <laughs> Corinne, uh, you know, I, I recommend against eating it officially. Um, if I, I, it is unlikely to be a problem, but this is genetically engineered. Don't put genetically engineered stuff in your body um, unless it's, you know, been through an approval process and everyone's been really, really careful. Um, so. FDA, genetically engineered, it's complicated. Um, but I would say if you engineered it in a lab yourself like this, eh, be really careful on that one. So um, talking about these five colors, uh, basically what I've done is I stuck a stick into this vial and I just kind of dragged it along this uh, nice kind of gooey surface that it grows on. And then um, it started to grow. And it's basically like mold, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So the idea is just like one little cell just kind of gets on a spot. And then it goes, oh, this is tasty. And it just starts to multiply and multiply and multiply um, until you've got these uh, colonies. And like I said, with mold, uh, well, you know, it's, it's whitish. Um, and E. coli itself is usually actually, yeah, this color, this teal that didn't come out, it's brownish. I tend to call it just biomass color is a lot of times what people say. Um, why then are these bright colors? So let's go back to our presentation to talk about how do you genetically engineer stuff to make cool colors? I'm not going to touch the computer with my hands. I might mess that up later, but <laughs> I'm going to try to be really good about it. 
All right, so let's go back. Whoops. Let's update our tracker here. Whoop. Okay. So now we're talking bio. What's going on, man? Um, so this is just a, a quick slide I put in in case my demos didn't grow to just see all the different kinds of art we've grown already with this. So you can see there's a lot of stuff here. And yeah, it's art, I would say. Um, so this is just this, the tasting. If you go on bioartbot.org, you can see all these pictures. We put uh, pretty much everything that gets submitted up there, um, unless people specifically ask not to. But um, yeah, I've been really blown away by the, the degree and impression of all these colors. But how do we get these colors? It's with proteins. Oh, yeah. So Corinne is asking, um, what is the surface that all this stuff grows on? We're actually going to talk about that and make it. Um, but basically, it's just this like really nutritious jello that microbes love to grow on. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So get excited for that. But for now, we're going to talk about our colors. Uh, proteins make up all kinds of stuff in our bodies, the bodies of animals, the bodies of single cell organisms. Proteins are doing a lot of the work here. Uh, I mean, going to start naming stuff in your body that's made of proteins, but it's kind of everything. I mean, your skin, your, your hair, your, uh, it's all proteins. That's kind of like the, the workhorse of what's going on with, you, um, with, with biology and what makes it unique and interesting. Proteins can do lots and lots of different things. It's a whole field of study. One of the things they can do is make colors. So it's just a, uh, a molecule that happens to reflect a certain color back into our eyes. So uh, in the case of uh, what we see on the left here, these jellyfish, these are glowing jellyfish from like deep sea organisms. And they make a protein in them that's called uh, GFP, or green fluorescent protein. And the reason it's called that is because, well, it's green. It fluoresces, which is that glowing. And it's a protein. So a long time ago, at least in terms of synthetic biology, so well, someone will have to correct me exactly how long ago, but more than 20 years ago, um, someone said, I bet it would be cool if I could make other stuff glow like that. So they found the gene inside of this protein or inside of this jellyfish and they pulled it out and they said now I have the instructions to make anything glow if I can make it use this gene and then going beyond that we can look on the right side here we get lots and lots of different colors basically by changing the protein a little bit so either it's a different protein altogether or it's a slightly edited protein and what that does is it just makes it reflect a different wavelength uh, so those of you who you know our, uh, our physics people might know that like light is all different wavelengths and it's just about what gets reflected into your eye. Um, so this is our palette. We can draw with any of this stuff if we want to use biology. So I said earlier that you get the gene. What does that mean? Well, basically, you pull out a bit of DNA and DNA is basically the instructions for making a protein. That's what, kind of what makes us who we are. We, we have this DNA inside of us, and it's um, just a big list of instructions that says, cool, so this is how you make this green protein. This is how you make, you know, for me, this is how you make brown hair. Um, and in this case, we pull out this bit of DNA that says, this is how you make a glowing protein. And then we slide that DNA into a single cell of E. coli. And as you can see here, our single cell of E. coli says, yeah, sure, I just make stuff. You got it. It's pretty much just there's, there's some machinery inside there that turns DNA into stuff. And for the most part, it's turning E. coli DNA into E. coli stuff. But if you put this other DNA in, it's just like putting it on the assembly line and something else uh, gets made. So. Um, I want to ask now, I want to ask chat, uh, got any cool ideas of what to do with these colored proteins? So I'll go back. So we got this green one here. We've also have all these different colors. So I want maybe some people can shout out, like, what, do you, what would you do if you could put these glowing colors into anything? I'll let you know right now. So pretty common to put them into, if you're doing biology, biology science, you put them into uh, a cell that you're trying to engineer. And you say, ah, I want it to do, uh, you know, 
I wanted to make a life-saving medicine, let's say. And I'm going to connect the medicine I'm trying to get to make to bright green. And that way I know the ones that glow also make the medicine. Another thing that people do with this is, uh, I've seen them put it in, in like, oh, pigment for textiles. Yeah, that's really exciting. You can just imagine a lot of pigments are already derived from uh, nature. So we go and we grind up a flower, a seed, um, a mineral, something like that. You can imagine using one of these pigments and saying, like, okay, well, let's just produce a bunch of this. And now we can just pull it out of our, uh, of our microbes and make a dye, make a, um, you know, bright clothes, something like that. What if we named all the colored reporters after Crayola crayons, burnt sienna? See, this I like. This, thank you, Callie. Uh, this is really cool. Yeah, I, I think we should, actually. Um, so we're going to work with, uh, in a minute, well, let me pull this guy out. And you can see this. This is called a 96-well plate. We'll talk about it uh, a little bit more later, but basically it's just a little plate with 96 little uh, holes here. I think we should make a 96-well Crayola Cran E. coli system. All right. So, last bit on biology here, and then we're going to go do some stuff. Uh, basically, um, like I said, so you, you just slip the DNA in, and I'm just going to touch on this. Okay, is it that simple? Do you just really, like, pull the thing out? Like, no, it's not. You don't just, like, get some tweezers and pull it out of a jellyfish, and it comes out as a long string, and then you go, here you go, Mr. E. coli. It doesn't work that way. Of course, it's actually quite complicated, because biology is complicated. We are complicated. Life is complicated. But what you actually need to do if you wanted to make some E. coli that made a cool color is actually even easier because you don't have to get it out of a jellyfish. You don't have to engineer it. You don't have to say, oh, well, I'll, I'll mutate it or I'll twist it. Um, for something like this, there's actually a lot of tools already where you can just sort of buy the protein. I'm sorry, not the protein, the instructions. Um, <laughs> Okay, Callie, yeah. I think, yeah, we, we got to get a postdoc on this, exactly. You're first in line. Um, so I've, I've linked a video here because I think it's really um, a little too much for today, but uh, check out this video. There's a, a YouTube series called Synthetic Biology 1 um, that I can recommend, and here's a video. It, it's about a 10-minute video, and it says, how do you put DNA into E. coli? And it's, it's not so bad. It's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is just sort of buy these plasmids. So I'll talk just a bit about a plasmid and what it is, just to kind of get your feet wet. Um, so we talked about DNA. A plasmid is a circular piece of DNA. And so you can see that right here on my mouse. This is DNA, and they just kind of stitch it all together in a circle. Why is it in a circle? If I'm totally honest with you, I don't really know. So <laughs> shout out in the chat if, if you know that. Um, and uh, Oh, and also th this is going to be archived on YouTube. So if you're watching this later on YouTube, yell at me in the YouTube comments about why it's a circle. Um, but here's the really important thing about it is you can just buy this thing. Everything on the right, this big diagram, looks really complicated because there's a lot of complicated stuff going on in it. But for our purposes, we just kind of need to know three things. There's this little bit here, this kind of big pinkish uh, arc. This bit of the DNA says, here's how to make a blue protein. Go do it. This bit, and kind of a lot of these other bits, are kind of cell operation stuff. Um, and we could kind of touch on that in a later class. Uh, but basically, it's, it's the, uh, it's like priming the pump kind of is a way to think about it. Um, if you just put the DNA in, nothing happens. But you kind of need like a little bit of like, here, come on, let's get started. Let's make some blue protein. Um, so that's what all that stuff does. And then finally, there's this bit on antibiotic resistance, uh, which is really interesting to the biology. Because if you are going to slip this circle of DNA into a cell, some of the cells are going to be like, you got it. Cool. And they go and walk over here. And, um, and they'll just start making it. Uh, other ones will reject it. Um, either it just kind of literally won't get through the cell wall. Or maybe they'll just they'll take it in and not really do anything with it because biology is complicated. So the way that we make sure that everything in our little test tube that we're going to make actually does make the blue protein, is we put this antibiotic resistance next to our blue protein DNA. So an antibiotic 
kills bacteria. So penicillin is a really common example. And um, normally, E. coli, if you just put, let's say, penicillin in, there's a number of antibiotics, but in this case, we'll say penicillin. If you put that in, yeah, they'd probably all die. But this little bit actually protects, this little bit of DNA here protects them from uh, penicillin. Or it, it's a different antibiotic in this case. So what we know is if we put this DNA in, some of our E. coli take it, some of them don't, then we add some penicillin, all the ones that didn't take it will die. And all the ones that did take the blue protein will survive because they're protected. And so now we know that everything living inside our little tube definitely will make this blue protein. So that's just a little more to kind of get your feet wet. Um, this is probably a good time for questions. Uh, what we're going to do next is um, make, Corinne asked earlier, what do they grow on? We're going to make some of it. So we're going to talk about that. And while I get set up to do that, if you have any more questions about the bio stuff, you want to ask, like, what, what is this circle? What's going on here? Um, shout it out in chat. Or if you just have general questions, uh, this is going to take a second because I'm going high tech. I'm going to put on a headset camera. OK. If you don't have questions, feel free to just tell me how cool the stream is. All right. Pop our guy on here. This is a neat little headset. That should make it so you can see everything that I'm seeing as we go work in the lab together. Um, Oh, that's a great question. I'm seeing that in chat now. Um, would the teal look more teal under UV light? I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe we should get a UV light and see. Um, I might have one around here, but that might be an after stream thing. Uh, I don't think so, because there's actually two kinds of things going on here. And we'll just take a quick detour to talk about that. Here, let me switch over to a big cam. Um, so this one all the way, oh, sorry, on this side is, uh, that's actually that green fluorescent protein. When you did your drawings, it looked yellow, um, but it's actually kind of a glowy green, sort of hard to represent on a web page. Uh, that is called a fluorophore. And what that means is it's a molecule that when you shine a UV light on it, pushes some of that light back out, so it glows. The rest of these are called chromophores. And what that means is that they're just colors. It's, it's more like a crayon or something. It doesn't really glow or anything. It just kind of looks a color. Um, and so the teal is a chromophore. And so I don't think it would react to UV light. But that was a really great question. And it doesn't hurt to try. It's a fun thing about science. We could just see. It's pretty easy to do that experiment. Um, I think the reason it doesn't work is actually a lot to do with that uh, uh, this guy here, this plasmid, is that um, I think it just doesn't like to work. Something about this cell operation stuff doesn't like to work at the same temperature as the rest of them do. So it can be a little too warm for it. Maybe it breaks down. The protein goes like, eh, now nah, I'm going home. And it just kind of falls apart. Uh, so I think that's what's going on there. But, you know, if, if you, if you want to be on the why does teal suck uh, investigation team, call me. All right, so I'm going to switch to the head cam. Ooh, we're in head cam mode now. Um, and I just want to check to see. Yeah, let's turn this, angle this down just a bit. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's pretty good. Cool. Um, so at this point, I cannot see chat because I'm walking away. Uh, so just um, if, 
if you have any uh, issues, shout them out, and uh, my producer in my ear will hopefully let me know. All right, so we asked earlier, what does it grow on? And the answer is basically really tasty science jello. Pull my cord just a bit more here. Bacteria, like nearly all of us, like to eat nutritious things that are good for our body. In the case of bacteria, I'm just realizing I only kept one glove. So now we get to do mismatched gloves. All right. In the case of bacteria, one thing that E. coli like to grow on is this. This is called LB agar mix. Um, LB can stand for Luria broth. Um, and it also has a different name that I'm not remembering, but basically some guy just came up with it. He was like, oh, stuff seems to grow on this pretty well. And uh, if you look at the ingredients here, you can see that uh, formula per liter, it's 10 grams of NaCl, which is table salt, sodium chloride, 10 grams per liter of tryptone, five grams per liter of yeast extract. So basically you just get yeast and kind of grind it up. And uh, if you've ever had like nutritional yeast, um, uh, like from an organic grocery store or something like that, uh, it's good for you the same way it's good for them. It's full of B vitamins uh, and it's full of, uh, basically it's all the stuff that yeast need to grow. And it turns out that bacteria also grow on those. And the final piece here is agar. Agar doesn't have any nutritional content. It's just, um, something that makes it, our material just sort of jello-y. So what we're really making here is science jello. So uh, what we'll do is we are going to make this nutritional stuff. We'll pour it into a, a plate. It'll set just like jello. And then that makes a tasty jello that anything we put our material onto is going to be like, oh, yeah, this tastes so good. All right, let's do it. So let's make it now. So you can just buy this. It's not in your grocery store or anything, of course, but um, lots and lots of places uh, that can do scientific supplies will just sell you this. I'm sure you could try to make it yourself, but um, it's sort of a theme for uh, today and this kind of biology is that someone's done a lot of the work already, so you don't have to. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make 250 milliliters of this material that you can grow stuff on. So uh, first I'll begin by pulling this out. This is called a way boat. A way boat is just a nice convenient thing to pour your materials into when you're trying to weigh stuff out. It doesn't weigh too much and it's flexible. This is our scale. I'm just gonna let it sit and then I'm gonna hit this zero button. Well, it's already zeroed, so great. Eh, pull out a little spoon here. All right, so what is the recipe? How do we make this stuff? that our special art can grow on? Well, usage. Dissolve 40 grams of mix in one liter of water, adjust pH if desired. No need to adjust the pH in this case. So uh, basically for every one liter of uh, material we wanna make, we'll use 40 grams of mix. So if you got your calculator out at home, we're gonna make 250 milliliters. There's 1000 milliliters in one liter, which means that we are making one fourth of a liter. So we divide 40 grams by four, because if we divide this by one liter by four, then we also divide the number of grams by four. And I don't think you need a calculator to figure out what one fourth of 40 grams is. That's right, it's 10 grams. So I'm gonna weigh out 10 grams here. You can see it's really not that much. I got lots of this stuff. Do, 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 do. Okay, a little above. All right, now that's pretty darn close. 9.98, nearly 10. We don't need to be that precise. We're just trying to make basically tasty soup for our E. coli. And then of course we're gonna let it set so it becomes tasty jello. But, you know, the same way that you probably don't freak out if you're like, mm, I'm sorry, this has 1% the wrong amount of salt in it. Uh, you'll still eat the food. Uh, e. coli are fine with that too, as long as it's nutritious. So we just dump it in here. You can see I just fold the guy. What I like to do is sort of flick it and that just kind of makes sure we get pretty much everything off there. Great, so now I've got my 10 grams in there. Now we just add water. This 
is distilled water. You can buy this at the grocery store. Um, the reason we buy distilled is because if you buy mineral water or water from the tap, there's a lot of other stuff in it. And we really just want this stuff in it. So we don't want to add any like, you know, magnesium, lime, you know, anything that's just kind of in water sometimes. So this is a graduated cylinder. You can see it's marked off the volumes and I want to fill to 250. So I'm just going to pop this open and pour. Do -do 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 -do. Just give that a read. It's a little low. Um, it's supposed to read from the sort of bottom of the uh, level. They call that a meniscus. So maybe just a bit more. Again, I, it's not, it does not need to be perfect, but maybe I'm being a little precious here. Yeah, that's pretty dang close. All right, so I'll just pour that in here. Set that aside. You can see, it's actually quite clumpy here. So what we're gonna do, is this is a, oof, this is a stir plate. Oh, I'm hearing, um, what kind of water do I use? Uh, well, this is nice brand water. I think it comes from the Walgreens down the street. Um, but it's, the important thing is that it's distilled. And so what that means is that the water is uh, boiled and they only take the steam part. Uh, and that is important because we just don't want other junk in it. So it's, it's really just pure water. It should just be the H2O molecules and nothing else. So hopefully that answers your question, but uh, you know, let me know if not. Okay, so what I did sort of mindlessly without thinking of it is I added one of these. This is called a stir bar. It's a little magnetic rod and it connects to a magnet that's inside here. So if I turn this on, you can see it starts to spin because there's magnets on both sides. And it's a handy way to mix stuff. We could always just do it with a spoon though. We don't really need to be too particular about this, but since we have the stir bar, why not? Okay. Yeah, I'm hearing there's a bit of a delay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just streaming for you. So if I get to your question, it might be just kind of a little after you ask. I might not be able to interact totally perfectly. Um, ooh, look at it bounce. I'm just having some fun here. Um, all right, so we're going to get the stirring. I'm going to try to like turn it way up, get it frothy, just to kind of get this gunk off the bottom here. Just get it all. There we go, all right. And then once that's all good, you really don't need to have it up that high. It just needs to stir a little bit. And then we'll set the heat on this one and we'll go until it boils. And the reason for that is to um, make sure that everything dissolves. So if you look at it here, you can see it's still pretty cloudy. There's little bits kind of floating in it. And once we boil it, that won't be the case. It'll be pretty clear. Um, so just to make sure everything gets dissolved. So I am just gonna let this set. I'm actually not gonna set the heat on this right now because I would totally forget about it and it would boil over and be a huge mess. Uh, but this is a cooking show style approach. So actually, I've already got one. Let's continue on. So what we would be doing, once that's all boiled and dissolved, is we would walk it over here. This is an autoclave. An autoclave is just a big, hot, steamy oven. So, Pop it open, look inside. It really is just, you know, a little cavern here. And um, we would put our material in there. We would seal it up using this sort of big, uh, big scary knob here because it does get to high pressure. The reason we do this is to make it uh, completely sterile because that material over there is really good for bacteria to grow on. Any bacteria, well, most bacteria many bacteria uh, and we want just our bacteria to grow on it so we need to make sure that that is totally sterile you can actually do this in a microwave as well it's just kind of finickier and uh, it can be a problem so if you've got the autoclave in the lab like we do it's a really handy way to do it but um, i've done it in a microwave before it works pretty reliably so what we do here is basically just heat the heck out of it until we're sure everything is dead and then we would go um into this box. This box is called a biosafety cabinet. It's basically just a big box that we're pretty sure everything inside of is sterile. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
And uh, we would just pour our material into some plates. So I'm gonna come over to here now to show you the end of the cooking show magic. We would take our liquid material, it would be hot, just like making jello. Put in the chat if you've made jello at home. I haven't made it since I was a kid, so I had to, do people still make jello? Um, but uh, we would open this up, we would just pour our liquid off, and then we would let it cool. And once it's cool, we would get this guy that I poured the other day. And by the way, if you're really interested in seeing this process, I did make a uh, YouTube, or I made a video of it the other day, and I'll put that on YouTube um, in the coming weeks. So we get this beautiful science jello. So check that out. I can really see, I'm gonna try to be careful not to breathe on it, because of course my breath would, might probably uh, cause something to grow on it. But it's this just nice, clear, kind of brownish stuff, and yep, totally flips over, it's totally, you know, holds in place. And it's sort of uh, jello-like to the touch. And now, I'm going to show you how you can make some colorful stuff by hand using this approach. So this is our canvas, and remember all those colors I talked about earlier? That's what's in here. So this one's pink, and this just came out of our freezer. We bought a bunch um, a long time ago, and we freeze them at a really cold temperature, negative 80 degrees Celsius. And um, then we just gotta thaw them out, and everything in this liquid, there's, there's billions of cells of bacteria sitting in here right now, and they're not pink now because they've been frozen, they haven't really grown very much, they're just like you or me, they kind of have like a childhood phase and then a teenage phase, and then once they kind of mature, they start to make that protein and they turn into that color. But right now they're still kind of like very, very early in their growing phase. So what we're gonna do now is we made a healthy, tasty home for them to live on and grow, and we're just gonna take some of this liquid and touch it to this jello, and we'll see it grow. I mean, over the course of two days. <laughs> um, so to do that, I'm gonna use this. This is called a pipette. And what it does is it moves liquids. So what I can do is uh, stick the bottom of it into here so I get this tip. The reason that you use uh, disposable tips is because I'm gonna put it in here, get a bunch of bacteria on it, and then it'll be, um, you know, it'll have a bunch of bacteria on it, so I don't want that anymore, and I'll eject it, and I'll get a new tip. All right, so let's start with the pink. Um, I'm just gonna pop this off. You don't need to do this in a biosafety cabinet. Um, you can, and if you wanna be really, really certain, but, uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm like really even barely gonna pick up any liquid. I'm mostly interested in getting the bottom wet. Um, let's see, should I draw something? Yeah, why not, I'll draw something. Uh, this is pink, maybe, uh, maybe just get some neat little eyes here. Oop. Oh, so you can see why I work on robots and not by hand, is because I am actually not that great with my hands. But don't worry, if you're not great with your hands like me, there's still plenty of opportunities to do science with robots. Okay, so I made two little eyes here. And so if we look pretty close, you should be able to see that. I'm trying not to breathe on it still. Um, we'll see how this one goes. This one's kind of a throwaway. I'm not being that careful. Okay, and then I'm just gonna put this cover back on just to be extra safe because stuff falls down all the time. Um, and I'll just pop this guy into my bag and then this bag will get disinfected before the end of the day. And uh, let's do blue. Blue is my favorite color. So I'll just stick the tip in, and as you can see, I kind of depress this plunger, and then when I pull it back up, it should pull some liquid up. So I'll push it in, pull the liquid up, and you see now there's liquid in there, and then I just push it back out to remove the liquid. When you first get into a lab, people spend a lot of time teaching you exactly how to use a pipette. I guess my opinion is, yeah, you do need to learn, but you'll figure it out. Um, it can be a little tricky, but once you get the feel for it, it's really, it's not too bad. So I'm just gonna make a smiley face. Why not? And then, uh, yeah, I'll call it enough. I'm gonna, normally you shouldn't put, put it back in like this, put liquid back in here. 
but I'm actually going to toss all these out. So put that there, toss out my tip, and you know, let's do one more. Um, eh, fluorescent is always cool. So you can see it says fluo. Just going to get a little liquid here. And remember, I've pulled up billions of cells into here. So all I'm, when I touch it, a little cell ends up in that spot in this agar, and we will grow some. So I'm just going to, let's do it like dot style. So it'll be a little more like the bio art bot. So I'm going to touch, 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 touch. And so each spot I just touched probably has thousands, thousands, if not millions of cells, and they will grow and divide. And in about 48 hours, we should see these guys grow. Okay. I have to tell you, I'm already getting tired of making dots. All right, cool. So we'll just do that. We can make some cool swirls and stuff out of it. You can actually do this with just a paintbrush. I've used the pipette here because it's what I have. And also to sort of show you a little bit about pipette. But uh, when we run these in-person classes at CCL, a lot of times we'll just use paintbrushes and just kind of touch them. So what I'll do here is cover this back up. And then normally what I would do is go put this in an incubator. Um, well, I would kind of seal it around the edges with tape and stick it in an incubator. We'll get more into that later, but so this will grow and I'll, I'll touch back on that in a minute, but that way you can kind of see what is going on uh, by hand and how we, how we make this art. Hello, we're back. Let's jump back into direct address mode. How's chat doing? How's it all going over here in chat? Uh, let's check in. Um, yeah, so that is our biology section. Um, and I think uh, my takeaway is because Maybe it was uh, different for you, but as I was doing all those little dots, um, I was like, yep, this is why, this is why robots. Um, because it really isn't too bad to just kind of do that pipetting movement. Um, oh, get a little, get a little, and it's kind of fun to push it off. But what if you had to do 10,000 of those? And that's really what a robot serves for us. So we'll talk about robots next. Um, and in fact, I'll, oh man, I gotta show you this, sorry. I forgot, I had this great, this great graphic uh, about like what they grow on, um, and I just loved it so much. So here's our, our bacteria trying to be big and strong, and he just loves to eat nutrient-rich jello. That's what we made, and um, that's how you make that at home. And that brings us to robots. So this is a time, I think I'm just gonna pop this guy off. We're gonna take a, a quick little break. So we've been going for, gosh, nearly an hour now. And so I, uh, I'm gonna get a sip of water, and um, if you want to get a sip of water, use the bathroom, whatever it is, uh, go for it. And um, if you have any questions, put them in chat. We'll address them when I get back. Uh, and um, yeah, I hope you like the biology stuff. Um, again, if there's any questions, anything you want to learn more about, let me know. Cool. Well, hello. Oh boy, I lost my little, uh, there we go. It's back. All right, we've moved on to robots. Um, Cool. So, who's excited to talk about robots? Uh, chat out in chat if you have a favorite robot. I think my favorite robot is probably from Pacific Rim. I just like those big robots. That was a fun, silly movie. So, um, yeah. Uh, I guess my second favorite robot is this robot right here, which I'm about to show you. Um, so, like, robots, why? <laughs> um, Basically, pipetting is tiring. You saw what I was kind of doing. It wasn't so bad, but like if you had to do a lot of them and you were here for eight hours and that was your job eight hours a day, you'd be like, there's got to be a better way. Well, there is. So let's switch over. I'm gonna hold the hand camera now and take a look at uh, this robot, get a better view of it here. So this is called a liquid handling robot. It's um, Opentron's brand. Uh, they sell these guys, it's about $5,000, which sure is a lot, um, but it's not very much as robots go. So it's again, the sort of thing that like, well, you know, if, if enough of us get together, we could afford it. Um, and so that's what's, what we're doing at CCL, uh, Counterculture Labs is, well, we could afford this, put it all together. So we get to use it here. Um, and uh, what is it? 
well, it's a box, obviously, kind of looking at it from a few angles here. Um, and it's a pipette. Remember, I was showing you that pipette earlier. I'm just going to stick it in here a little bit. So that uh, is just that thing hanging down is a pipette, and it's on a bunch of motors. And so the motors let it move to different spots, and it can pick up some liquid, move it to a different spot, get rid of some liquid. And that's kind of it. It's a big old box with uh, you know moving pipettes. So this is what we have, and we can actually do quite a lot with it because it can pipette. Well, let's switch back over here. Hello. Um, yes, yes, loving, loving the robots in chat. Uh, oh yeah, Marvin Depressed Robot, very good. If you haven't read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy um, and you like nerd stuff, that's a good read. Um, oh yeah, and BattleBots, gosh, I haven't... I haven't thought about BattleBots in a long time. Uh, that was a fun show. Um, but we're here to do robots that, uh, robots for peace, not robots for war. Um, so, okay, how do you tell a robot what to do? You use what we call a protocol. Protocol is pretty simple. It's, it's a, a series of actions. So actions are things like, hey, transfer from here to here, mix this stuff, heat this stuff. Um, our guy can basically pick up from here, move it to there, pick up from there, move it to here, etc. Um, so what we do is we string together all these actions to make a protocol. So we just action, action, action. So it'll be like, hey, go pick up from position A, put it in position B. Now pick up half of position B, put that in position C. Mix. It's like a, a recipe or a cookbook. The way that we actually, you know, make this happen is with this code. Now this might be a little hard to read depending on the size of your screen, um, but luckily this whole kind of top half is not that important. It's just, uh, it's just information to like, you know, tell other scientists what you're doing or uh, help the robot operate. Kind of the same way I was saying there was like cell operation stuff. It's like not that important right now, but like you know, the cell needs it to do stuff. The robot has really similar things. There's a, a couple of lines of code you have to write that just say like, hey, I'm doing a robot thing right now. But we can ignore that all for these purposes. So we're just gonna look at this bottom half and I've kind of zoomed in on that here. So this is a uh, computer code. It's written in a language called Python. Python is um, a really good kind of language to start learning programming. Uh, and it's really, really common around the world. It's used in all kinds of stuff. Um, we use Python for both uh, the robot side, but we also run the entire biorobot or website off Python. Um, so it's a good kind of starter language. If you've never seen any code before, don't worry. This is, uh, we're just gonna walk through it um, and it's, it's not too complicated here. So this first part here just lets the robot know where its instructions start. We say, it's looking for this word run, um, and it says, uh, hey, use this protocol context. That's a complicated part. You just literally need to write the same thing over and over and the robot knows, oh, cool, I'm looking for that line. Then under there, that's where we actually start giving instructions. The first thing we do is we say, okay, cool, let's load uh, a pieces, some pieces of labware. So labware is, if I put a glove back on, I can show you, labware is anything like this, um, or maybe like this, which is a bunch of those pipette tips. So uh, I kind of think of it, you know, like silverware, Tupperware, uh, flatware, plateware. Um, that's what we mean when we say labware. It's just like, yeah, it's like a dish. Um, and so the first thing we do is like, hey, there's going to be uh, a plate here, and it's a Corning 96 well plate, 360 microliter flat. That's this guy. You can tell it's Corning brand. Um, and then we're going to say, oh, by the way, there's also a tip rack. That's where all these tips are. And we're just letting them know that one of them is in position one and position, and one is in position two. So each of these little slots on the robot has a, a number written on it. And then the next thing we say is that, okay, and also I want you to use a pipette. In this case, I want you to use this P10 single pipette. You can kind of see that right here. That's just the name of the pipette. The reason it's called P10 is because it holds 10 microliters, and a microliter is a millionth of a liter. So very small amount. 10 microliters is really, really small. Um, and so we say, hey, make sure you use that size pipette. Um, and that's on the robot. Then finally, we just tell it what to do. So, um, if you just look in these last four lines, the first thing we say is, okay, using that pipette, I want you to go pick up a tip, 
Then I want you to go aspirate, and aspirate means you draw a liquid in. Uh, and I want you to do 10 microliters from our plate, uh, position A1. And we, we name them um, in these plates, okay, we name them like battleships. So A1 is this spot, A1, and then B1 is you go down one row, and then it's B1, and so on. Uh, and then I want you to move that material to position B2 and dispense it back out, and then go get rid of your tip. So that's really it. I mean, so th this is actual code. Like, th the robot will read this and, and do stuff with it. And so, sure, there's like little bits you need to learn, but um, for the most part, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. Um, so, let me know, uh, woo, um, what do you think, uh, what, what do you think would happen, um, Let's just say if we added a new uh, add a new line, and then we said uh, left pipette aspirate plate C1. Um, so if you have any thoughts on that, if I just wrote that code in, what would happen? Um, let me know. And in the meantime, we're going to test this code. Uh, all right. And so to do that, I'm going to switch over to this view. Cool. Let me pop this out. Okay, so this is our OpenTrons uh, app. They provide a handy app. It just connects to the robot, makes it nice and simple. I'm going to switch this, flip this switch, which will connect us to our robot. And we can sort of prove we're connected by hitting this button for lights. And you can see the lights come on and off. So that's cool. OK, so I'm going to take that uh, protocol. And it's as simple as just sort of loading it up. Um, so I go here. It's on my desktop. Here's the little demo. This is that code I just showed you. Hit open, and I'll say, yep. So now it's just going to double check that like everything I just gave it works. This one might. I, th I think it'll work. I haven't tested it. Yeah, OK, now it's ready to go. And now it just needs to calibrate. We're actually not going to run this whole thing, um, because I think it's been more fun to show uh, it running on like your art. But uh, if I hit this proceed to calibrate button, you'll see it'll move. So OK, remember, we said, oh, put the tip rack in position 1 and put that well plate in position two. So I will go do that now. So here's our tip rack. Slot that in one. Yeah, you can't quite make out the numbers, but they're there. Um, and then I will pop open this guy. This is in a pack because it's sterile. Um, it's just hard to keep things sterile in a, in a lab, so. Um, it's easier sometimes to just buy these pre-sterilized packs from the, from the store. All right, so I've got them in position one and two, just like it asked. I don't need to clear these out, but eh, maybe it's a good idea just to, you know, you make, you make what's happening here physically match what the robot thinks is happening because it's just a dumb robot. It doesn't know what's going on. It just says, can, can it be like this? And if you don't make it like that, then you know, it's, it gets confused. OK, so now this is our pipette. And it's going to move to the tip rack to just kind of double check that it knows where the tip rack is. So I'll hit this button. And there it goes. Oof. And I tell you, the first bunch of times I, I ever uh, ran this thing, it's just, it's just moving. And you're like, oh, no, I think it's all going to break. Um, so. What it's asking us to do, because it doesn't know, it said, I went to about where I think things are. Can you, can you double check that I'm right? Um, and then so I click these buttons here to sort of just say, nah, you're pretty close, but you're just a bit off. So I'll kind of move it over a bit. And then just kind of inch it in. And I'll move over here to this hand camera just for a second so you can see really what I'm talking about, because we're really just inches away, or millimeters even. Uh, there we go, there's the camera. So as you can see, yeah, it's, it's even hard to focus. So we're trying to be right above this A1 position. And we're pretty darn close in this case. We kind of come from this angle. 
So there you go. Pretty good. And we'll say that's good. And then it's going to try to pick up the tip. Just like I did when I was punching it down. Oh, there you go. See, it got the tip. And uh, yeah, we're pretty happy with that. All right. And then it's going to want to calibrate in the next spot. And you know, we're pretty darn close to finishing this guy, so why not? Um, that's just a little bit off. This part is, this is one of the reasons that this robot is um, not like $100,000, is uh, you have to manually calibrate it. Some of the really fancy guys, you just, they just figure it out. So I save calibration. It's gonna go return that tip for us. And then remember we looked at that code earlier. What it was gonna do was pick up a tip, move some material from A1 to B1, and then it was gonna go uh, get rid of the tip. And you can kind of see here, this is its plan. It's written out every step it wants to do. And so we'll do that as soon as it finishes homing. All right, I'm just gonna hit start run. Oh, it wasn't done homing. Patience, patience is the name of the game with these things. Okay, so it's gonna start its run. It should just go pick up a tip. This might go wrong. And then we should see it, uh, I didn't put any liquid in here, but we should see it um, sort of pretend to move stuff. All right, is it gonna get the tip? Yes. And then what I'll do is I'll actually pull this out of the way. This is usually not good practice, but I want you to be able to kind of see what it's doing a little better. So it goes from A1, it picks up some imaginary water and I put it into B2. Okay, it's all done and it gets rid of its tip. Ta-da! So nice simple code. Um, and then if we wanted to put something in a different shell, it's just a matter of adding one more line, pick up from here, put there, move this around, that kind of thing. Okay. Well, now I think we're ready to actually print your bio art. So get excited for that. I'm gonna take just a quick sip, uh, break to get a sip of water and I'll be right back. Um, in the meantime, now that you're robot experts, just uh, let me know what do you want to do with a robot? What in your wildest dreams would you wish a robot would fix in your, in your everyday life? Um, so we'll be back in about one minute and um, we'll be talking about printing your art. Hello. We're back. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about, um, well, let's review. So far we learned how to make microbes that grow and make beautiful colors and grow on tasty science jello. And that's great. We can make, we can make these great colors now. And we also talked about how to program a robot that can put things in any pattern we say. So we go A1, B6, 12, sunk my battleship, et cetera, et cetera. You get it. Uh, <laughs> um, so awesome, but you made cool art. What, what does any of this have to do with your art? Patterns, colors, et cetera. But like, okay, how do we take the art and make you know, all these parts work together? So there's a missing piece here. Um, and I think normally I would ask like, well, you know, toss out uh, guesses. They're like, okay, what, what is the missing piece? How do we fix this? What is the missing thing? I think we're on a delay right now. So I'll just tell you. Uh, the answer is software. So we've got, uh, ooh, I should be in presentation mode, shouldn't I? We've got this data. It's, it's like a drawing of Pikachu. On the other side, we've got like actual living representation of Pikachu. <laughs> uh, and we know we have colors, patterns. What is missing? It's that piece of software. And that's the software that will translate a grid that we drew in on a website, and that was fun, into a physical grid on a plate like this. So how do we actually say like, okay, but like it's, one inch from here, go up and move over. You know, like you would actually do giving instructions to something. And that's what our software does. 
it figures out how to go from just like, ah, I clicked in some boxes into like, okay, but this is a real thing that I can pick up and hold, and it's growing and it's alive, and that's cool. When you make a drawing on bioartbot.org, we store it just like we're playing Battleship. So this is a really simplified version of our grid. It's just six dots, and this is how we store it. We just, we just save literally a text file on the cloud, um, and the text file looks like this. So if you're not used to reading code, this might look a little like, oh, there's a lot of square brackets and curly things, and I don't know what's going on. You're mostly safe to ignore those. If you are used to reading code, um, this will look pretty familiar. This is called a JSON format. And basically, it's just sort of a list that says like, okay, here's all the pink stuff, here's all the blue stuff, here's all the teal stuff, and the orange stuff. So in this case, we drew pink in the top, right, top left corner. Um, so like I said, it's like Battleship. Uh, there's two differences. We don't use letters at all, so it's number, number, and we start at zero. That's just like a computer thing. So the top left corner is zero, zero. And then, so we write in our text file here, pink has a listing at zero, zero. Then blue has one at zero, one. Teal, zero, two. And so you can just kind of look around. You just kind of look at it like a table there. Notice we've got two oranges here. And so orange, we actually say, okay, well, orange has two listings. I'm going to do one at one zero, comma, another one at one one. Great. And then finally, notice we didn't put anything into position uh, one two. And so we just ignore it. Anything that doesn't have a listing just says, eh, it's probably blank. So we don't even have to worry about it, which is really nice. And this is it. I mean, like, th this is what we're doing. And there's a lot of, like, website stuff that kind of helps all that happen. And the internet is an impressive and great thing. But um, we're pretty much just saving text files here. So you can imagine then, if we did color in that last one, what would happen? Uh, exercise to do at home is like, okay, well, what would change about this text right here if we colored this spot at 1, 2, yellow? Okay, so that's how we save the text file. Now, how do we turn that into actual robot stuff? Because still it's kind of like, well, we've just sort of saved it in a convenient way. I'm showing you this code, and it's all blurred out. Um, and the reason for that is because the code itself doesn't matter. It's just three basic sections. But this is our robot code. Earlier, when we told the robot how to move, we're doing the same kind of thing here. Uh, it's just a little more complicated because it helps us support all this art stuff. So this first big block, that's instructions that just says, here's how you make a pixel. Every time you want to like put down a pixel, this is the set of instructions you need to do it. So it's you know, move over, pick up some of the color. Move over to this pixel spot, touch that spot. That's pretty much it. Um, then we have a section that says, okay, well here is where I'm gonna put all the pixels I want you to make. Here's my big punch list of pixels. And then finally it says, okay, now go do that. So we give it sort of two pieces of instruction. One is, here's how you do the thing. The second thing is, okay, well, here's all the things I want you to do that for. And then finally it says, and go. And that's that last section. And that's it, so this is a template. Um, and what's really nice is that the instructions are pretty much the same because drawing is like, well, you still get a pencil no matter what, right? Um, maybe you draw a different thing, use different colors, but I'm still drawn with a pencil and paper. So when we go to make your actual uh, robot procedure, all we do is we take this text file here that we saw earlier, we slip it into that spot where we were, said we'd put all the pixels. And then we just download that and we've got it. Now we've got it and we're ready to give it to the robot. So we've got this procedure. It just says, well, here's how you make a pixel. Here's all the pixels I want you to make. Please go do this. And it's that easy. Robots are, um, they're so dumb and they're so great. Uh, but if you give them clear instructions like this, they're just like, Mwah, chef's kiss. Um, really helps you out. Okay. Um, so let's see, did I, I don't even remember if I have another, no, I don't, okay, yeah. I think we're ready to go, guys. Guys, get excited, we're gonna print some art. So I'll hit escape on this, and I will now go over to bioartbot.org. Let's actually start at bioartbot.org, I'll show you the whole thing. So we type in bioartbot.org here. You've uh, probably made a drawing, and this might look familiar to you. You know, you can click here, you make your drawings. It's fun and great. Um, I am now going to enter the secret administrator mode um, by typing slash print on the end. And this will make it so I can make instructions for a robot. Now, if you also want to make instructions for a robot, 
just let me know. I don't have to be the only user on this thing. Um, this is meant really for lots of people to be brought in. OK, so here, you do have to log in. That's why, it's, that's why I'm perfectly comfortable telling you about this, is because it just doesn't let you do anything if you haven't logged in. So I'm going to type my password. And to do that, I'm not going to show you my password. Uh, not that I don't trust you guys, but you know. This is going out to YouTube. Everybody in the world will see it. Typing in the old password. I could have pre-done all this, but I wanted you guys to have the authentic experience of password typing. Hit login. Did I move back into presentation mode? What just happened there? Well, luckily the password's hidden. Whatever. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Uh, all right. Anyway, <laughs> I'm changing my password. Um, so uh, now we get to see this administrator view. And we can see all of your beautiful art. And I'm just going to take a moment, scroll through it. Let's all appreciate the art. It's very cool. I really like all these. Uh, and I got to tell you, it's, it's just so awesome to see just people you know, being creative, putting stuff out there. I love some people are inspired by uh, the biology, some people are inspired by like the size. Uh, this one's really cool, exploring big and small. You know, it's, it's, it's space, but it's also biology. Whoa. Um, shout out to Salinas. Um, and so now all we just do is we pick the ones that we want to print. So we can make nine at a time. So we're going to do nine right now. And then uh, we'll do the rest of them uh, after the class. So I'm just going to skip these first two because they were submitted from uh, a long time ago, kind of during the pandemic. You can see this one says Happy Thanksgiving. We'll print those eventually. But those of you in the class uh, this time, um, I want you to see those. So click, click. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. OK, so we're going to print these nine now. And then we'll have, uh, gosh, I think another one, two, three, four, five, six that uh, I'll do after the class, so we'll, we'll get them all. And um, yeah, let's just take a second. Great job on all this art. This is really a you know one gloved hand <laughs> clap. Um, this is so cool. Thank you guys for making all this, and uh, I hope you really like to see uh, the final result. So now I just have to click. You can see I've got my little bucket here of all my art that I'm going to print. Double check that there are in fact nine. Great. I'll hit request print protocol, and this will do that templating process that I showed you a minute ago, where it slips in all the profiles all the pixels into that spot. And it gives us all this output. It says, like, here's all the art that I did. Here's all the slots you should expect to use. Uh, this one's pretty easy because it's just um, uh, 0 or 1 through 9. So it just uses all the slots. Uh, and then I'll just click to download my procedure. And there you go. Uh, I think that showed up. Yep, you can see I have downloaded it now. And so I will. Minimize this, and we will be ready to upload it. So I'll switch over to our OpenTrans app and say, hey, I want to do a new protocol. So I'll hit open here. It's like, OK, cool. What do you want to run? I am a professional, so I did make a backup of this. Um, but I'll go to my downloads, because I just downloaded this fresh artistic procedure. That was a little wink. Uh, when I was writing this originally, um, artistic procedure, I think, sounds funny. But um, all your art will be here. So I'll hit continue. Um, and now it's going to simulate it. This will actually take a second, because there's, this is a lot more complicated than the one we were just looking at. But um, let's see. So it's going to simulate that. And in the meantime, I'll go ahead and just show you uh, exactly what your procedure looks like. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. This is going to look a little funky because I'm doing this, doing this on the fly. Uh, let's create a new window. That's what we want to look at. 
All right, so this is all your code. You can see here's all the procedure stuff. Uh, just kind of zoom in a little more here. Good enough. All right, so this is all the how do you make a pixel. And then here are all of your beautiful pixels. Look at this. It just kind of goes and goes. This is a lot of work. Uh, the robot's going to do it, so it's not a lot of work for us. But you can see it's just these are all the pixels. And you can actually kind of see like, oh, yeah, there's Wabi Sabi Flower. Here's Exploring Big and Small. So it is calling out like specifically which one will be there um, and telling us, you know, well, here's all the places that stuff will go. So this is you can actually see what the code looks like. Um, and then finally, we say, you know, go do it at the end. So I just kind of want to give you that little field trip into what your code actually looks like. And we're going to keep simulating. Um, so this is another good time to ask questions or just shout out your piece of art. Um, I think uh, self-promotion is, <laughs> is very welcome here. Oh, OK, great, we're done. But keep shouting out your art. Um, so now we just need to calibrate it because again, the robot eh, it just doesn't know a lot of stuff. You can see here we expect to have uh, our 96 plate rack right here. We're gonna put our I call that the pallet plate, but that's gonna hold all of our liquid. It doesn't have any in it yet. And then finally, we need to put nine canvas plates. So I will now grab the canvas plates. So these I pre-poured, uh, but this is 10 beautiful canvas plates. And I poured these a couple of days ago. It's just science jello. And I put them in a little sealed box. Well, I taped them up so that they would stay relatively uh, microbe free. Put them in the fridge just to be safe, the same way you do with you know anything you don't want microbes growing on. And like I said, there'll be a video about that on this channel if you uh, want to watch that whole process. And don't worry, it'll be all edited and sped up, so all the boring parts you can we'll get fast forwarded through. All right, I'm going to set this aside, um, and we'll throw it out a little later. But here we go. Oh, our beautiful boys. That okay? Whoa, I worried for a second that someone actually was growing on it. But uh, yeah, nice and clean. You can see there's a little fog there, so we actually store them upside down specifically so that you don't get water droplets um, like falling onto our, our delicious science jello. Um, but now I just gotta slip these guys in. Oh, I see a question in the chat. Um, why decimals instead of integers? That's a great question. Uh, I have made, uh, I've simplified a, a few things. Um, all the concepts are really quite straightforward here, um, but it's life, man. Everything has little details you have to deal with. And so one of the details is instead of giving like position 0, 1, position 1, 1, is we found out that the robot can go a lot faster if you actually, um, instead of saying like battleship coordinates, you say how many millimeters from center. So if you can kind of look here, if this is the center of my plate, I say, okay, I want you to go five millimeters up and 10 millimeters to the left from center. And that's where the pixel is. It's just the way the robot works is it tends to be way, way faster, like, like five times faster. Um, and in fact, if you look on this channel, there is a comparison posted that shows you the old way where we did it purely battleship style and this new way, and it's just, it's loads faster. We still store all the data battleship style, but when we do that like loading part, it does a conversion. And so um, it's a trigonometry basically, um, which sounds, you know, complicated and scary, um, but uh, we just, you know, it, it, <laughs> it took me like 30 minutes of sitting with a pen and paper being like, oh, what is the formula for this? Um, but now it's just in there and it, it just kind of does the math with triangles to figure it out. We got one left, just going to set it aside for now. That'll get used later. All right, so now we've got 10 beautiful empty canvases just waiting for your art. Let's get going, man. So now we're going to move to the tip rack. Oh, way off. 
Can you see how off that is? Look at that, that's crazy. Um, so I need to move this, and this one I'm gonna be really, really precise on because Opatron's, Opatron's done me wrong once or twice. You see this and you're from Opentrons, get at me. We gotta, we gotta fix this guy. Um, but uh, it's, it's actually quite effective, but has this weird little bug where it sometimes just misses the tip and you can get in lots of trouble with that. So I put in a lot of um, safeties just to make sure that it definitely picks up all of these tips when it's supposed to. Uh, but it seems to work better when I'm incredibly precise with this first calibration. So uh, yeah, bear with me. Another great time to, uh, you know, ask some questions or grab yourself a drink um, because I'm going to be ruthless about getting this exactly right. So I walk over here. I can see it's a little too far north. We inch it. We inch it over. Um, that's pretty darn close. I'm going to look at it from another angle. You might hear I kind of have this love-hate relationship with robots because they're so cool, but they can be so frustrating. It's just like anybody you love, I guess. It's <laughs> um, you just have to work with them, you know. Okay, that's pretty even. Do this one again. Yeah, pretty good. I'm gonna just walk it down just a bit. I'm using the arrow keys um, as a shortcut here, so if you're wondering why I'm not actually clicking the buttons and the robot is moving, uh, it's a little convenient to use the arrow keys. Ooh, do I like that? Yeah, I think that's it. All right. So now we're going to pick up a tip. Uh, looks like we got the tip to me. All right, move to next labware. All right, so luckily we don't need to calibrate all nine. That would take forever. We just gotta do one and it figures it out from the rest of them. Uh, so this case, um, we programmed in this piece of lab where it's kind of custom to us. So the way that we calibrate it is uh, arbitrary, but it does have to be done the same way every time. So I just try to get the tip right in the very, very center of it. And if anybody's really interested in like specifically you know, how we figured out the physical geometry of each of these plates. Um, yeah, we can definitely talk about that, but uh, for now it doesn't really matter. It's not something you absolutely need to know. Okay, that's actually pretty close to center already. And then normally you would calibrate with the tip or the, the cover off for most of these, but I have set these particular ones up so that uh, you calibrate with them on so that they stay as sterile as possible. So what I usually do is I double check. I just kind of move it until I just see that plastic move just a bit. Oh, there it went. Okay, save that calibration. All right, now it's going to want to calibrate to finally our 96 well plate here. This one I am going to take the cover off because um, it's, uh, it's more of a normal plate that is designed to have the cover off. Move to next labware. Oh, that's way off. What happened, Opentrons? Dunk. A little lower, a little lower. Oh, fabulous. This part is way more fun with a buddy. So, you know, in post-pandemic times, having a little robot duo is, is the way to do it. And yeah, I'd say it's pretty dang good. Save calibration, return tip, and proceed to run. All right. Uh, Melissa in the chat, is this like Shinampa's Opentrons? It is. It's pretty much the same thing. I think yours is newer and nicer, actually. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, the same thing. So we can do the same thing on this. All right. I didn't like the look of this tip. This is just kind of a experience thing. I don't know. It just kind of looked like it was a little charred at the end. So I'm going to move this last guy into position one. Um, all right. Now, 
you might have noticed. Hey, where's the bacteria? We gotta get it. So get ready for our final field trip. Um, and I'm actually gonna spray this with our trusty friend isopropyl alcohol one last time while the covers are on. If the covers were off, I think we would be, uh, <laughs> we'd be making it a, a very poisonous uh, thing, but for now. And so doing this now because I do wanna get all the sides and everything. Um, and it's probably making the camera hard to look at. So hopefully it will all dry by the time we're actually doing this. So we'll rub this down a little here. You know, and the risks are relatively low with this stuff. If I was working with something that was really harmful to humans, I would be a lot more careful. Um, but for now, uh, you know, I'm all right sort of reaching in and waving stuff down. Um, still trying to use good practice, not waste anything, but. Okay, so look at our open trons here on the left. You can see it says in big bold letters, check before running. And that is because the order that we need to put our materials in is, um, going to change every time because, well, if we had our full 96 uh, Crayola thing, then who knows what colors are gonna be in each print job. So these change every time. And uh, so we just need to remember this. We're gonna use pink, teal, peach, fluorescent yellow, then blue in that order. Um, and so get ready for our final field trip before we start to print. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna go back into Cybertron mode, so just gonna clip this to my belt. Oof, it's so important. I'm like all wired up and everything. Um, okay, and so uh, da, 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 da. we're gonna go get our bacteria and load that into a plate. Head cam. All right, so to do that, we're gonna pay a visit to our friend, the biosafety cabinet. Um, so we talked about this a little earlier, but basically you don't need one of these for this kind of work, because again, this is pretty harmless stuff, but it is good practice. If you have one, you should definitely use one. Um, and uh, the idea is basically that there's not, um, everything inside is pretty sanitary. Oh God, except for this fly. What are you doing fly? You're ruining my class. <laughs> You're making me look silly. Get out of here, fly. Um, that doesn't usually happen, but when it does, it is hard for the fly to get out because the way this works is that there's a big old filter up here and it uh, filters all the air that comes in and then it actually sucks that air back. So this is like has downward force right here. So it makes like an air curtain and the flies kind of get stuck along the bottom of it. Um, one of the side effects of uh, having this place be uh, a lot emptier during the pandemic is it's a little messy maybe you noticed um, okay so I'm gonna work with my hands inside this box so I am putting IPA all on my gloves and also up my arms uh, no that is not great for my skin but uh, you know I don't do it that much so it's fine it would just dry it out um, in like a professional setting a lot of times they have like special sleeves that you can use for here we're good to do this it's not gonna kill us. Okay, my hands are nice and clean. I've got all of my colors. Uh, pink, actually, can I get my producer to remind me the colors? Um, and if not, I can go back and uh, put that back on the screen. I think it was pink. Oh gosh, and then it's like fluorescent. Blue was last. Oh, this is like a horrible like, um, memory game from a point and click adventure, or, you know, some kind of video game. I'll get my stuff ready. So these are, again, these are sealed, um, sterile 96 volt plates. We're gonna use a fresh one here just to be extra safe. And I'm gonna pop that open, set that aside. Here is again a pipette. This is a 200 microliter pipette. We're gonna put about 300 in each of our wells. Um, you really don't need very much uh, because all we have to do is get like one cell at each pixel. So we really don't need a lot of volume at all. 
So the way you adjust the volume that this picks up is you just turn this knob and you can kind of see here I'm going up, 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 up. Okay, and then I'll lock it back in position. And then I'm gonna have to go double check. I thought I would remember it. Uh, that was hubris on my part. <laughs> so let's get the order right. Okay, the order is pink, teal, peach, fluorescent yellow. So the old PTP, fluorescent blue. <laughs> Great, I could do that. So the bummer about kind of coming in and out of this is, well, you, get, you gotta do all this again because we just wanna be really sure nothing gets in. I also earlier sprayed all this down with alcohol. So pink, teal, peach, oh, I had it right. Okay, great. So let's look a little more closely at these. It's pink. You can see it's got liquid, about a milliliter of liquid in here. This is again, just like millions and billions of cells that will produce pink and they're just kind of growing in this the diffuse medium. And we're gonna put them on something so that they can warm up, grow and reach their full potential making color for you. All right, so I lift the lid off pop open my tip box here. I'm gonna pick up my pipette, stab this guy here, unscrew this, depress my pipette, stick the tip in, draw up 200 microliters, and put that in position A1. Now, uh, normally you might adjust this again down to 100 to get exactly 300. Uh, I'm gonna do it the lazy way. Uh, this is really not recommended if you need any precision at all, but uh, we don't, we just need to have enough in each of these. So uh, I'll go about halfway down there, just kind of until it's about full. Okay, there you go. Um, and then I'm gonna eject that tip into there, that'll be my garbage and I will clean that up later. So pink. Next is teal. Another tip. You know what could do this really effectively is a robot. Great. In you go, in you go. And then we'll just get a little more. Yes, yes. All right, teal, time to show your metal. Can you impress me this time? Come on. It's frustrating because I'm really mad at Teal, but I'm pretty sure Teal doesn't care about me, you know, just because they're bacteria. Work our way down the column here. And get a little extra. Oh, beautiful. Oh, nice. Great. So I'm trying, maybe not doing the perfect job, but I'm trying not to wave my hands too much over this. Um, that's good sterile technique is stuff falls into um, your materials. That's usually the way they get infected. So uh, you try not to like wave your hands or you know make a bunch of extra air currents if you don't need to. I'll put that into position D1. My ultimate feel right now is that I am actually doing this wrong, but I'm not looking at chat. So you guys are all going like, no, no, you're doing it wrong. Okay. And finally blue, blue will be our last guy. See, notice we didn't use the whole milliliter. Um, we actually did an experiment before where we put these back and froze them again. And uh, we actually got decent results. They, they, they grew okay. So I, I might try to refreeze these. Normally you would try not to do that, but uh, you know. It doesn't hurt. The nice thing about biology is that once you're growing it, it's pretty much free because it just keeps dividing. Uh, so we can always get more. It's, it's more just a matter of work because you gotta load them into the tubes and freeze them and kind of do all that. But. Um, best practice would be to just get a fresh one out every single time. Uh, all right, so we've loaded it up. You can see I've got each of my colors here. I put my lid back on. Uh, these lids have nice little grooves, so it probably won't spill. 
uh, but I'll be careful anyway. And then, um, yeah, we're gonna carry it over. This is our five color Creole box. I have big dreams of more. And if you wanna be a person who helps with that, let's talk, you know? Um, because we can totally get more colors. It's just anything we can engineer, we can make. All right, I pop that baby in. Snap that one back into position. These guys are all down. I got exciting news, guys. We're ready to print. Okay, so we'll switch back to our, this scene. Pop this guy off. All right. Thank you for being on my side about the fly chat. I really appreciate that. Um, cool. Uh, so I think we're ready to start this run. Let me just kind of make sure everything, I like to be extra safe because once it kind of gets going, it stays going. Um, and to answer uh, your question, uh, ADBC, ADC, um, uh, nine to print. On average, it takes, a, it's like five-ish minutes um, to print. So, uh, Let's, um, uh, about 45 minutes, I guess, is what that math comes out to. So, uh, but that's not everything. It really depends on how much people draw, because it does one at a time. And so what I'll do is uh, get going here. I'm seeing that my earbud might actually be off. Thanks, Catherine. Um, but I think we're pretty much ready to go, unless... <laughs> Unless, Catherine, you have a very important producer thing to tell me. Um, uh, but otherwise, uh, I'm going to take this lid off. Take all these lids off. Don't, don't mess that up. I just set these to the side. It doesn't really matter if we mix them up because, at least theoretically, they have nothing in them. They should be entirely sterile. I'm ready to grow. I saw a question in the chat. Um, that was asking, uh, hey, I sprayed a bunch of alcohol on those tips. Is that a problem? Um, alcohol dries pretty quick, not totally quick, but also uh, it is unlikely to have hit the bottom of the tips. So I'm a little cavalier about it. I guess best practice might have been to cover them ahead of time. Um, but for the most part, the bottom of the tip is really what we matter or what matters. And um, we probably didn't get very much alcohol at all in there and it would have evaporated by now. Okay, so now I close this very carefully because a, uh, this, this kind of swooshes in um, air in, and so we might be swooshing in, uh, you know, microbes and stuff, and we don't want to do that. I would really like to make this have a sliding door instead, but eh, one thing at a time. All right. And now we just press start run, and the magic begins. Well, let's switch. We don't need we don't need this big app thing anymore. We'll go to get you a bigger view of this beautiful art that we're going to make. All right, start run. Wish I had like a fanfare a drum roll, you know. So it's going to home. That's just checking all of its zeros, kind of making sure it knows where it is. Then this is one tricky little thing that I put in here. Uh, it's going to pick up the all the way to the left bottom. Tip. So the one closest to us and to the right of your camera. And the reason it does that is because, like I said, OpenTron's done me dirty a few times um, where, okay, good, we're good. Great news, guys. This is going to be a huge success. Um, it messes up somehow, and it like picks up the first tip correctly, but not the bottom tip. And once it's off, it's off, and we got all kinds of problems. But So this is just my way of proving that it can pick up both the bottom and the top. And um, all right, now we're gonna go get A1. But we're past that. So yeah, this should be this should be a win. Let's go. Oh, look at it go, look at it go. Oh, it's putting pink in there. So this is it. Gonna watch it for a little bit. Um, in fact, uh, let me just, uh, you know, we got plenty of time. Let's look at some of these questions. And this is pretty much Q&A time now until uh, people get bored and wanna head out. Um, so uh, let's see, is this like um, open trans? Yeah, that fly got on there. Um, let's see, yeah, we talked about how long it could print. Yes, you can definitely reuse it. I like that about uh, biology is that um, 
it's, you know, it's, it's free, right, man? Like, you need a little bit of sugar, but sugar is cheap, and you can make crazy stuff from it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, Cali, ideas, bioluminescence, iridescent, yes, 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 absolutely. Um, so there's a, uh, a huge range of this stuff, and all we have to do is make them, right? And we talked about how, like, it's pretty easy to transform it once you have the plasmid. We just got to get those plasmids. This is happening, folks. So, um, yeah, this is a great time to just, you know, if you have more questions, want to talk anything else about, basically we're just going to watch this for a little bit. Um, and then I have some resources I want to show you. Uh, but in the meantime, what I will do, I'm going to give you a zoomed in view using our hand camera here. Zoom. Up. Okay. So let's just get a different angle, get all the sweet angles. So I went to get more. And check that out. You can even see it through the little gap there. So what it does is it just stabs the agar. It just touches it. So, um, and there's a little bit of liquid in each uh, in the pipette, but it puts almost none on there. And the reason we even pick up any liquid at all, because you could probably get away with just a drip, is that it puts a little bit and then it drips out a little more. And so just kind of make sure that the tip of the pipette always has just, just kind of a drop of uh, material on it. And then when it runs out, it just goes and gets more. Ooh. All right. Uh, so what am I seeing? Let's see. So that's this view. I was going to switch back to this robot view. But I hope you're appreciating it. Um, robot. Cool. Yeah, let's do chat stuff. OK. It's going to get a new tip. I don't think it's done with pink yet. Um, the reason here is that because it does stab the agar over and over, we found that every once in a while it get clogged. So just as a safety measure, we say like, yeah, after about 150 stabs, just go get a new tip just to be safe. Check out chat. Um, tips for teens who want to learn more. So we do this every single uh, week. We do just a little Google Meetup. Um, it's very low key. Uh, you know, come if you want. You want to ask a few questions. If you just want to get involved, uh, it's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and there'll be uh, links for that um, in this presentation. And uh, I'll make sure everybody who signed up uh, gets those. So you can come to that, talk more. Um, I think, uh, additionally, I mean, you know, keep submitting. Keep, you can email us at ccl.artbot if you just want to get involved some more. And um, yeah, if, if you have a robot, I know down in Chinapa you have one. Um, I think, yeah, you can do this with that robot. Use the same website and everything. You just download the protocol like I did. And, uh, and we'll just get you the strains. Um, for the strain stuff, we're still just kind of figuring out what is the best way to ship those around. And we're trying to get better ones. Uh, but you can do this, I mean, even with at home, something like kombucha, which is something that you've mentioned, Corinne, um, when we've talked before, is that like Corinne is, or <laughs> Corinne, um, kombucha is totally food safe. You can do that in your kitchen. Um, and so you could try drawing something like that as well. Um, so that's just kind of like a way to get started, started, and then kind of branch out from there. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, yeah, could we make Surratt's a Sunday on Le Grand Jatte? Uh, I think so. One thing that we're working on, and if anyone um, wants to help and learn kind of how to do it, is make it so that you know, the drawing tool is pretty simple on the website. And we kind of want to make it easier to draw something, you know, if, if you're a strong artist, be able to draw something a little more interesting, or maybe even upload um, you know, a painting like that Surratt painting. And so we're working on that right now. And uh, we invite you to, to come uh, help on that. Uh, lids. Um, I think that was probably when I forgot to take off the lids. So thanks for sh sh uh, the heads up there. Uh, what else? Uh, wild isolates of bioluminescent iridescent microbes. No bioengineering needed. Awesome. Let's get them. Um, yeah, email me. Uh, let's figure out um, how to do that. There is one kind of quirk of the biology there. Is remember, we talked about the antibiotics and the resistance. So. These guys are all um, uh, resistant to, God, what are they? Oh, it's, it's an antibiotic called uh, chlorophenicol. And so um, if we wanted to paint with something wild, it probably is not resistant to that. So uh, we would just have to not use that. And you know, there's just a greater chance that something gets contaminated or something. But whatever, let's have some fun with it, man. Um, I mean, that's the great thing about this. The pointillism painting, totally. Um, 
if the pipette goes too far down, what happens? Um, I guess I assume you mean like too far down into the agar? Uh, kind of nothing. If it goes so far down that, I mean, it kind of messes up the agar, it looks weird. But um, other than that, the agar, it's, it, it really is the consistency of jello, like it kind of just splits. Um, in a structural engineering, uh, that's called a, a yield point, is it yields at some point, and then it's just split in two. Like it kind of gives, 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 and then breaks. Um, so it does that. If it does hit the plastic, uh, probably the pipette will break. Um, but the robot doesn't know what's going on, so it'll just keep going and it'll break the pipette. And yeah, we'll get weird results out of that. Um, what else? What else? Um, can the plates be much larger? These plates are called SBS. Um, it's just a standard. It's like 120 millimeters um, by 80 millimeters, I think. So it's like a three by two ratio. Uh, and they, they snap in. So if we wanted to go larger, we would just have to find a way to kind of snap them in, but we could definitely do it. Uh, it's probably a little bit of, um, you know, 3D design, doing some CAD, that kind of stuff, and like 3D printing something that kind of like holds the small one and then lets, you know, is an adapter kind of. But um, yeah, we could definitely do it and I think it would be a great idea. Incidentally, the distance that we use between the pixels here, I don't know, I just kind of picked it. So it could probably be different. I think they could be closer, they could be farther. Um, because it's biology, we get some interesting results where uh, sometimes they're, um, if they grow really close to each other, they kind of compete with each other and one of them maybe loses, one grows. Um, and, uh, Okay, yeah, Cali, these wild iridescent um, strains that are resistant to canamycin, cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, where are your wild microbes sourced from? I would love to know that. Um, and yeah, great, so we can put canamycin in and, uh, and go from there. Um, of course, these E. coli are not resistant from canamycin, so we'd have to draw with one or the other, but that's fine. And uh, yeah, long term we could make E. coli that are resistant to canamycin. It's just about finding the right plasmid um, or maybe doing that engineering ourselves. Uh, so that's some lab work. Uh, what else? What keeps track of how much of the pipette's volume has been used? Um, we used to do this kind of in the code itself. We would say, okay, pick up 10 microliters. Now put one microliter down. Now change, you know, your, your uh, you have an internal variable that says how much volume do I have right now? And um, then you just say, okay, uh, current volume equals current volume minus one or something like that. Uh, Opentrons has gotten a lot better about tracking that as part of their um, system. So we're kind of writing this code. It's all in Python like we talked about, but uh, it uses, and this is one of the strengths of Python, if you're not familiar, is it uses what is called packages. And so packages are um, code other people have written that you can just grab and use part of. And so we use Opentron's code base um, to help control the robot. They've done a bunch of stuff that kind of like handles stuff like that. Um, so the robot, or it pretty much keeps track of itself right now. The pipette, uh, just every time you dispense something, it says, oh, okay, yeah, I'll minus whatever. And then we can check that value to say like, oh, hey, if you're below some level, please go get some more. Uh, what else? If you had thicker agar plates, could you do multi-level art, like drop colors and different depths? You definitely could, and I want to try it, and I have never had time. Um, so yeah, I think we can totally go 3D. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's you know, try to figure that out because that would be so cool, right? Like a uh, layer to be like oil painting or like um, you could almost do like sculptures and stuff. There's a whole world, uh, if you just kind of want to Google something, just like Google bioprinting. And it's a whole world of how you make like 3D structures out of biology and it's really, really cool. And I think we can make this do some stuff like that. Um, but it would be, you know, fun. Uh, okay. What else? Great questions, guys. Everybody, thank you so much. Um, seawater at Woods Hole, Mass. Of course, come to Woods Hole. Uh, oh, I didn't know you, you, University of Chicago had a marine biological laboratory. That's neat. Um, that's great. Yeah, let's definitely talk about that. Um, so those are, oh, Vibrio Fisheri uh, from Bobtail Squid. Cool. Okay, so Callie, is that, um, so Vibrio Fisheri is a species of bacteria, right? Um, but they, it sounds like they're isolated from a gene from some squid. Uh, so let me know about that. Oh yeah, Catherine, you can make a Rubik's cube. Oh man. Okay. 
guys, we need to go make a Rubik's Cube out of biology. Wouldn't that be cool? Oh boy, that's the new dream, right? You could, you could make a Rubik's Cube and then maybe you could even like, if you want to get like to some serious biological engineering, you could figure out so that they change colors at some point. And so you can be like, ah, oh, when I shine a light on it, it'll change to be, instead of this side is red, I, it'll change it to orange, you know? Um, and that's like, that's stuff people are doing. They've made it so you can like shine certain color lights onto bacteria and they will change the way that they react. Of course, it doesn't happen immediately. Biology is a little bit slower than, you know, robots. But, um, uh, oh, bacteria, uh, uh, let me finish my thought. Sorry, I got excited, Callie, reading your chat. Um, but, uh, yeah, but you can do that. And that, that's like part of, it's called a, a genetic switch. Um, and it's called light-induced uh, promotion. So um, we should totally do that. Let's make a Rubik's Cube. New goal. Uh, bacteria symbionts with squid. That's very cool. Um, yeah, so I know uh, just kind of for uh, other people, I'm uh, not that familiar, but um, there's like, so E. coli is uh, a species, um, and, and biological names are done like, uh, the, there's the first name, which is like the, the uh, let's see, kingdom, order, and phylum. Ugh, I think it's the order. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the first part of the bacteria name is the order, and then the next part is the species. So E. coli is Escheria coli. And then um, Callie is talking about a different order of bacteria called uh, Vibrio uh, fischeri. And I know there's a lot of cool work going on in the Vibrio space right now. Uh, but I'm not that familiar with it. But it sounds like it's like a really cool place, and I, I would I would like to play in that space as well. And uh, yeah, I invite you guys to to come play around as well. Um, I mean, really, this is this is this is for playing with, right? Um, and it's it's a great way for us all to like learn and figure out just like I don't know what do we think is cool. Um, all right, how's our robot doing? It's just gonna get a new tip. We're doing pretty good. Um, this is a great time for final questions. Uh, if not, I don't think I'm gonna sort of uh, stick out, um, you know, make you watch everything. Like I said, this will take about 45 minutes. Uh, really depends on how much each of y'all drew. Um, some of them are quite detailed, which I love. Everyone has made better drawings than I ever have. I make these sort of cheesy, uh, you know, test drawings, like cool art. Um, and yours are gonna look really great, so I'm excited to see that. And um, yeah, otherwise, um, I think, yeah, maybe uh, I'll just let it run for a few minutes and you can kind of sit and watch it and be a lava lamp for a bit. And then, uh, uh, you know, we'll stop scream, stream at some point. Um, oh, genus, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, let me correct myself on this. The first word in uh, uh, Escheria coli is it's the genus and the second word is the species. I knew I got that wrong and thank you for correcting me on that. I don't want bad information out there. Um, I, thought, I saw when you said genius, I thought you said genius, right? And I was like, it was genius. That was a great idea. Um, great, yeah. Uh, let's talk more about that, Callie. And, um, oh, oh, yeah, let me put up while this is printing, just a, as a final goodbye, and then we'll just like look at the robot, and then the stream will just kind of cut off at some point, is, uh, let's go back to my slides. Um, and I just want you to see some possible resources here. If you want to learn more. Let's pop over to presentation mode. Okay, here are some resources. Um, so uh, yeah, if you just want to make more art, bioartpot.org, uh, uh, because of the pandemic and everything, um, it's not something that we can just do all the time. That's kind of why we had to have a special class and have people sign up. Um, but uh, you know, you can still submit stuff and you know, we'll print it when, when it's sort of possible. Uh, you can support CCL through there. Just uh, there's a donation link, it's through PayPal. Um, and you can donate you know, any amount of money and it helps support this lab. It's a nonprofit. It's really meant for anybody to come in and do this kind of work. Uh, you can email me, tim at bioartbot.org, or if you kind of want to email something specifically about this robot and like, you know, printing your stuff or whatever, um, ccl.artbot at gmail. I'm on Twitter, uh, at Tim S. Dobbs, if you're a Twitter person, um, I'm 
there probably too much, but you can always talk to me there. We can chit chat about this stuff. There is a weekly meetup. Um, and uh, it's just on meetup.com. You can sign up. That's totally free. Um, and it's just uh, through like Zoom. Uh, our code is totally open source. Every single part of this is totally free and you can play with it. Um, and that link is there. Uh, you have to learn a little bit about Git if you don't know how Git works already. Um, that's totally something I can help you with. But in the meantime, you can definitely click on that link and just kind of like poke at stuff. You're not going to hurt anything. Uh, and finally, if you want to learn more about Counterculture Labs, be involved in this great space. Um, just go to counterculturelabs.org and check that out. Uh, I'll leave this up for just a second more and then go back to the robot. And, um, and then I think we'll call it. Uh, let's see. What else? What else? Uh, Let's see. Yeah, Callie. Um, yeah, I can join you. Um, George, uh, do you call I need oxygen? That's a complicated question, actually. Um, for this purposes, mostly no is probably an okay way to answer that, but it's actually really in depth. Um, so, yeah, uh, workshop was fun. Thank you, Trisha. Um, and thank you, everybody. Uh, and, um, yeah, so that's that. Um, I'll just put on the robot for another minute. You can just get you know your last uh, last view of of this cool work and your art being printed, and then look for later next week to see um, you know like final versions of your art. Uh, and then uh, yeah, all this information will go out. Anyone who signed up for the class will just get all these slides, so uh, you should have everything there. All right. So thank you all again so much. It means a lot that you all came. Thank you for interacting. And this was a ton of fun. And I'm really glad that this could be kind of our first live stream for BioArtBot. So keep doing science. Keep making art. Keep playing around with technology and science. This is really cool. And um, yeah. Stay in touch. <laughs>